Good afternoon and thanks for coming. My name is Greg Niemeyer and I'm here for Letters and Science 25 and we're so thrilled to have a public audience and uh, really grateful for the Berkeley Art Museum's uh, support and uh, the wonderful staff that makes these video captures possible um, for us to share and uh, enjoy for a long time to come. Um, it looks like we have to enter a password. Do we have to do that right now or not? Yeah. As a timer? Okay, so, so that's what it wants to do. Okay, I guess they're all good. Okay, so um, we're going to uh, talk today about creativity, writing tools, and the politics of pens. And in fact, we have a great uh, guest speaker here today, Professor Vikram Chandra from uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, is going to talk about um, both his practices in writing and the uh, uh, issues with uh, reception of text and uh, circulation of text and censorship, but also tools of writing and how, what keeps this creativity going. So we're shifting in this course series a little bit from uh, the architectural and the visual to the textual now. And uh, so I'm very excited about that. I also want to acknowledge that um, currently in the Bay Area, you can see a really wonderful piece by South African artist Candice Brights. And it's called I'm Your Man. And it's about uh, old older men singing the whole album of uh, Leonard Cohen's I'm Your Man. Uh, a cappella, and it's quite moving and quite touching. And uh, so if you have a moment to go to San Francisco, check out the Jewish Art Museum, uh, check out that show. I think it's going to be very rewarding. Candice also has a show in uh, Los Angeles called Too Long Did Not Read about um, sex workers in uh, Africa. And uh, that's a, a similar kind of dra dramatization of um, human experiences, which uh, leads to a lot of compassion and comprehension uh, in the area of sex work. So both of those two shows are um, highly recommended. And if you have time, check them out. Uh, I'm going to move on to our slide about the assignment you're working on right now, the project you're working on right now. It's called A Note from the Future, and it fits very well with uh, uh, Bikram Chandra's expertise. In fact, Bikram is teaching right now a class in Utopian Futures at UC Berkeley's um, English department. And uh, so we're looking forwards to your notes from the future that will be testimonies of a future that you imagine somehow uh, projected back into our time. And uh, maybe also they will have writing systems and writing tools that have not been invented yet as of now, but they will be invented in the future and it'll be cast from the future back into our present. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, so our series of guest speakers continues with Vikram Chandra uh, following uh, Gail de Kosnick and preceding uh, uh, I said that wrong. Following Stephanie Sihuko and preceding Aya de Leon, de Leon, who's also a writer. And I hope you all have the book that we reserved for you by now. And uh, you should have, you should be deep into it, like halfway through by now, at least. Uh, we want you to finish it certainly by next week. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, uh, now let me introduce uh, Vikram. Um, so I, I met Vikram about a year ago in a, in a Zoom meeting, and we had a really uh, wonderful set of conversations about uh, media and technology and writing and so I found I found Vikram's uh, work to be very inspiring. He's a teaching professor for uh, in English at UC Berkeley as I mentioned and he's the author of the uh, book series Sacred Games which also turned into a, a film series on Netflix and so you can watch that it's very very intense dramatic and I love the the uh, poster that came with it Sacred Games with the uh, which is right here on the slide and uh, I love all the eyebrow action there it's very cool very dramatic. And uh, um, uh, Vikram writes uh, text, but he also writes software. And uh, he writes about software sometimes, but he co creates new software uh, uh, right now for uh, developing novels. And that's called Grantika. And he'll tell us all about that. He was born in New Delhi, India, and uh, moved to the United States after initial education in India, and got a BA from Pomona College, and then a Master of Arts from Johns Hopkins, then also an MFA from the University of Houston. And in completing these two uh, master's degrees, he was able to write his first novel, uh, which uh, which uh, became very, uh, very well read and very, 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 uh, <coughs> which had a great circulation. Celebrated author and programmer Vikram Chandra will talk today about how new writing tools, including artificial intelligence, inform his creative work, how the dual stars of technology and narrative can leverage and support each other, but also how the dual stars of creativity and convention can clash in the context of censorship. With uh, these notes, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Vikram Chandra. Thanks so much. 
All right, I'm going to turn this over to you. All set. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, as Greg said, I'm a fiction writer. And so I'm going to be talking to you about history a lot, um, contemporary history and a little bit of medieval history, uh, because history is also kind of narrative making and it informs who we are um, in terms of narrative, but also in terms of technology. So I'm a fiction writer mostly. I've published one book of nonfiction and have done some work in film, but fiction is what I've been writing since I was a kid. In the writing world, it is generally agreed that there are two kinds of writers, planners and pantsers. Planners are the people who draw out chapter outlines and character sketches before they start writing the story. I'm the other type, a pantser, as in I write by the seat of my pants. I always begin with the vague presence of a character in my head, maybe an outline of a body and a hint of an emotion and a glimpse of a landscape. But I know nothing else, not who this character is or what she wants or where she is going. For instance, uh, Sacred Games, which was a novel I published uh, in 2005, is a 900 page monster about cops and gangsters, spies, and various kinds of intrigue in the Indian subcontinent. The first scene that came to me was this. Over an intercom system, a policeman is talking to a gangster who has barricaded himself inside a strange bunker-like house in a Bombay suburb. I knew this policeman, Sartad Singh. I had written a short story about him, but I had no idea who this gangster was, why he was inside this bunker, what he and Sartaj were going to talk about, and what would happen next. Now I did what I usually do. I sat in front of my computer, wrote a sentence, backspaced over it, and rewrote it. As I wrote and as I went about my business in the world, I started to see the gangster more clearly. Soon he had a name, Ganesh Gaitonde. I slowly worked out his backstory, who his parents were, where he had come from. Every day I knew him a bit more, and when I wrote sentences and gave him shape and story on the page, I started to sense the shape the narrative was going to take. By following him and Sartaj by writing them, I found other characters and landscapes. So this is what uh, in the writing biz we call discovery writing. Um, so uh, you, when you discover what you're writing by writing. E.L. Doctorow once said, writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights, uh, but you can make the whole trip that way. This is true. Or for me, it's more like I'm trying to make my way through trackless meadows and wastelands in a bullock cart drawn by two unpredictable beasts named ambition and despair. And what illumination I do have is from a no uh, nasty, uh, rusty gas lantern hanging between the two. Cars and headlights are entirely too sophisticated and efficient to use in any metaphor about my process. But still, what Dr. and I use in the bus this business of discovery writing are tools to write. If you can only figure out what you should write by writing, the tools you use to write are all important. When you show up at your desk every day, whatever the state of your mind and imagination might be, your tools better work well. Without them, you can't even begin to uh, step through the fog. This is why writers have always gone on and on about number two pencils of a particular brand and writing desks and index cards, and why I recently felt gladdened when I found out that Kafka wrote his diary entries in quarter sized notebooks for most of his life, but then towards the end, stopped using those and continued writing in smaller octavo sized notebooks. Whatever else might have been going on in Kafka's life then, at least he found some beautiful blue octavo notebooks to work with, to work in. These things matter. I've been making up stories in my head ever since I can remember. I first started to write them down in sixth grade in the back of my school notebooks, which as it happens, also had blue covers. And I wrote my first story with a fountain pen. Until the fifth grade, I'd only been allowed to do my schoolwork with a pencil. 
you weren't considered ready for the complex machinery of a fountain pen until fifth grade. And like most other kids, I had used Nataraj, Nataraj pencils. This was a hugely popular brand in India at the time. Their ads, was, their ads were omnipresent. Here's one from television, which I think is from sometime in the 1980s. शुरू हुई पेंसिलों की दौड़ और जीत गई बॉन्डेड लेड वाली पेंसिल नटराज नटराज पेंसिल एंड दिस प्रिंट एड इज फ्रॉम द 90s आई थिंक हियर नटराज इज डूइंग देयर हार्ड सेल थ्रू दैट ग्रेट पैन इंडियन रिलीजन क्रिकेट The copy tells us that Nataraj writes perfectly, smoother, darker, sharper, without breaking. So Nataraj writes longer than any other pencil of its kind. That means more writing pleasure for a longer time. Notice that both ads focus on durability. Although there is talk of pleasure here, the message here is that Nataraj pencils have a longer lifeline. These ad advertisements were aimed at the kind of people who spoke English and who could afford to buy TV sets. This audience is often referred to in India as the middle class still, but in comparison to the vast majority of Indians, they are substantially well off. In 1971, the total number of people with enough disposable income to put in this bracket was 112 million people out of a total population of 547 million. By the 1990s, the middle class comprised 30 million which still comprised uh, which still was less than 1% of the population they lived in relative comfort but disposable income was still very limited and the constraints of a central centralized socialist economy with very high income taxes had taught them to keep a sharp eye on expenses what you wanted were products that were sasta or tikau cheap and durable and so these ads were designed designed to convince the consumers that these were the salient virtues of natraj pencils hindustan pencils the company that made natraj pencils also made apsara pencils which were more expensive and not ad, uh, not advertised quite so much to people looking for cheap and durable this clever segmentation assured total market domination for hindustan pencils and meant that when you saw a kid with a clutch of apsara pencils you were impressed by their sophistication and consumed by envy To its credit, the company somehow managed to keep this common ownership of seemingly competing brands an open secret and enhancing the cachet of the Apsara brand. This fact recently made the rounds of Indian social media resulting in some consternation. So here's one guy who's saying our childhood has been a lie. And then uh they used to give Apsara pencils as first place for tests. right so if you scored the highest in a test they give used to give you that so ballpoint pens were expressly and extremely forbidden as far as school work was concerned even though the g flow 77 was ideal for students our teachers told us ballpoint pens will spoil your handwriting uh because you would write too fast you know and they would skid all over the page and penmanship was very important our lives were ruled by regular tests and end of semester exams all building up to the all important 10th and 12th uh, grade board exams board exams were centralized public examinations such as the all india secondary school examination run by the central board of secondary education if that sounds terrifying to you it should boards determined the course of your life the marks you got in the 10th class boards would determine where you went to high school and the 12th grade boards would then point you to certain colleges etc cetera, etc cetera. in these board exams the the booklets in which you wrote up your answers would not be graded by your teachers but would go off into the maws of the central board system where anonymous examiners would assign faithful marks to your efforts and you really didn't want to piss off one of these overworked underpaid strangers with handwriting they couldn't decipher so from our earliest encounters with schools we were given compliments uh, like compliments like your handwriting is so good or the opposite um here's my first mark card 
a grade report from sixth grade, which was sent to my parents. Um, uh, and these things were sent to my parents every month. Uh, notice handwriting about midway down the page. I'm not sure why neatness and handwriting and so on are listed under faithfulness. I suppose we were supposed to be faithful to the academic ideals of the school and the nameless gods of the Central Board of Secondary Education. During the semester, around this time in September, I made my first official formal effort to write down a story and I did it with a fountain pen. I suspect that most of the people in this audience uh, have never held a fountain pen or used one. You might think of them as obsolete primitive technology, but they're wonderful, beautiful pieces of engineering. Uh, generations of people have put effort into making them better writing tools over hundreds of years. And I really mean hundreds of years. In the 10th century CE, the, four, the fourth Fatimid Caliph produced what we would call today a spec or a specification of technology that he needed. Right? So he needs a fountain pen which contain, con, contains the ink within it um, and writes when you desire without having to be refilled. The job was handed off to an unnamed craftsman who came back after a few days with a working implementation fashioned in gold, we are told, fit for a caliph. We are told that the pen released a little more ink than was necessary, so the craftsman took it away and did the necessary bug fixing. And then... Um, that was a happy moment of invention and execution, right? Um, so, so it actually worked. Uh, Caliph was very pleased and his scribes could now write elegantly. So here's a very rough sketch of what a modern, uh, how a modern fountain pen works like. Um, as with the Caliph's pen, the liquid ink is contained inside it in the barrel of the pen's body, right? Um, this ink is uh, inserted into the reservoir through a variety of methods. With some pens, you put the ink in with a dropper. In others, there, are, there is a vacuum filling mechanism that drives, draws up the air from a bottle powered by a lever or a simple pump. And in others, you uh, put in a cartridge. When you hold the pen upright, the ink naturally settles at the bottom and the reservoir because of gravity. Um, there is a feed system inside the pen that sends the ink from the reservoir to the metal nib. Right? So you're seeing the nib with the feed system um, upwards. The feed uh, is inside the nib. If you take the feed out of the nib and flip it over, you'll see there's a very narrow slit that goes all the way from the top to the bottom. So what you get is a control leak from the barrel down the feed, and the ink moves downwards because of capillary action. Those little fins down the sides of the feed regulate the, account, uh, the amount of ink and store some between themselves. So when you're writing fast or applying more pressure on the nib, uh, you get more ink. Um, on the nib, you also see a slit, which al again allows the ink to move down, again through capillary action, all the way to the hardened tip of the nib and makes contact with the paper you're writing on. The slit on the pen is designed so it matches up exactly with the slit on the feed. And it also then allows air to go up the feed uh, as, as you write, so it empties, uh, it replaces the ink that is going out of the pen. So what you have here is an elegant uh, machine that lets you put ink on paper. And it uses a, um, a minimum of actually moving parts. Uh, <clears throat> so when we started writing pens in sixth grade, we also, of course, developed knowledge about how to maintain this machine and use it best. When you first bought a pen or a nib, you'd get a scratchy slide across the paper as you wrote. So you sat down with some fine-grained newspaper um, and gently and carefully worked the nib against it and smoothed it until you got the ideal gliding touch. Every few weeks, you washed out the barrel. Um, if you still had ink gunk in the fins on the feeder, you used a sharp blade to uh, clean it out. Um, if you were writing and the feeder and the nib stopped drawing ink, you'd make a jerking notion like this to get everything working again, and which sometimes sprinkled ink all over the, the area around you. And this was also really good for ink wars, uh, which left uniforms stained with long slashes and spatters. And then your parents got mad at you, or, or you know, the, the school prefects got really angry at you. Um, 
Sometimes when you are pressed down too hard, especially on a nib you'd been abusing for too long, uh, you get, you got a flood of ink on the paper and then you'd have to scramble to get what was called blotting paper, absorbent paper. And, and so you could get the ink, the extra ink uh, absorbed. Um, otherwise you would, you know, everything would go south. So I continued to write fiction with these fountain pens, completely unaware of the political history of steel nibs and, the, and fountain pens in India. So some of you will know about the depredations of British colonialism in the subcontinent. The nominal Indian GDP in 1700 CE has been estimated to have been 24.4% of the world's GDP uh, by 1950, uh, uh, <clears throat> just after the end of British rule. So this exploitation was achieved through the deliberate policies of destroying pre-modern Indian industries and crafts, such as the textile industry, which dominated the entire world in exporting handloom uh, um, uh, cloth and really fine muslin cloth, right? So the, the phrase about the muslin cloth was, it was so light that it would float in the air. Right? Um, so, but what the Brits did is that they converted India into just a source of raw materials, which were taken and sent back to Britain, uh, manufactured into goods and then sent back to India and sold to Indians, right? And therefore you get the decline of, uh, of the economy. So Mahatma Gandhi saw this destructiveness as the essential na uh, nature of industrialized capitalism. He therefore rejected machinery and idealized manual labor. The adoption of machinery was a moral evil. And if India wasn't currently making up-to-date machinery, it was because the wise men of the past had told us not to. Um, he rejected not just capitalism, but also socialism, communism, and representative democracy. His utopia was an anarchy that was perfectly moral um, and, and consisted of um, independent village republics uh, that, didn't, that weren't industrialized. So the economy of these forever static villages would also be based on trade in kind. Right? There would be no cash because as soon as you having, uh, start having cash, you get the beginnings of ca industrialized capitalism. Um, the word Swadeshi means of our own country. In response to the flooding of Indian markets with foreign goods, the Swadeshi movement had been launched in 1905 as a boycott of foreign goods. So Gandhi gave a fillip to this uh, in 1921 when he pledged to boycott foreign made clothing and marked this beginning with the burning of a huge stack of such garments in Bombay. Um, these are, this is another bonfire somewhere else as Indians all over the subcontinent started following this, uh, this, um, this initiative. And what you would do then was the idea that you would return to the pre-modern methods of making cloth, right? Which was you, on a hand loom, you first made yarn. And then those were, uh, the, from the yarn, you made cloth, homespun cloth called khadi. Um, which everyone was supposed to wear. Notice the caption on the drawing, concentrate on charkha and swadeshi, right? So this was a general message, which was not just political, but also moral. Um, as the leader of a huge political movement, Gandhi wrote all the time. He produced innumerable newspaper columns, books, letters, and notes. His ideal uh, writing tool was a reed pen, which he associated with this utopic self-sufficient village economy. Um, in this collection in the Gandhi Museum in Kolkata, uh, you can see objects or tools that he actually used, including um, his traditional footwear, but you can also see reed pens, right? Can you, on the, towards the top right? Oh, left, oh, over there, uh, along with the associated inkpot. Um, and in an essay uh, titled, The Reed and the Pen and the Fountain Pen, he writes, uh, that the village dweller has not to work under high pressure or to speed about from place to place in other parts, right? So there's not this constant hurry. Um, and so you don't need to do this because you shouldn't have industrial hurry and the pressure of time. Um, and then the fountain pen becomes this tool that allows you to write faster than the reed pen. And so, but he has to compromise, right? But what he compromises with is the steel nib, right? Which is the, older than the fountain pen. You put the um, the steel nib on the end of a um, um, long um, handle, 
and then you had to dip it into the ink pot and write. So there was this kind of repeated motion. Um, uh, and then, but eventually, because he writes so much and he has to write faster and he needs more speed and effic efficiency, he has to compromise, right? But this hurts him, right? So one must realize that this is a compromise and keep the final goal constantly in front of the mind's eye. Um, the final goal, of course, is the recreation of this supposed utopia of the past. Um, and so you're only using fountain pens kind of along the way. But finally, for pur purposes of efficiency and output, like I was saying, he ends up using a fountain pen. Um, Gandhi's romanticization uh, of pre-modern village uh, anarchy um, also required him to be a casteist. Uh, he was a fervent supporter of the Varna ashram system, the ancient basis for caste. Right? So Varna means social class, while ashram refers to the four stages of life prescribed by tradition, uh, which are, you know, you're first a, a child, then you're a, a student, and then you're a householder. And then finally, as you get older, you retreat from the world and look to your spiritual uh, advancement. Um, the, the class system, the Varna system, divided humanity into four classes. The Brahmins, who were the scholars and priests, the Kshatriyas, the warriors, the Vaishyas were the merchants uh, and traders and cultivators, and the Shudras, the servants, lived to serve the upper three castes. There are also people who are completely outside this classification, who are beyond the pale, and regarded and treated as the so-called untouchable, uh, now known as Dalits, the Dalits. So um, uh, the same system, uh, the, the system, the class system that I've described is a kind of abstract ontology. Each of the Varnas, the, the broad classes, contain thousands of jatis or, or actual uh, practicing caste. So each caste is an instantiation of a particular Varna. Right, I hope that makes sense. So Varnashrama, Varna is the theory and Jati is the practice. Um, <clears throat> and, and then even within the specific caste themselves, you have hierarchies, right? So there's some Brahmins who are higher than Brahman, uh, other Brahmins. Um, they're more Brahmin than other Brahmins. Um, and so the way that he justifies it, and, and uh, I should also say that he insisted that in order to be a Hindu, you had to support this idea of the Varna system. Um, so uh, he, and what he wanted to do, uh, I'm sorry, the, the virtues of it were that it was a, an, a perfect organizing system, right? Um, and so, so in the recreation of the former utopia, you were supposed to go back to this, right? But what were supposedly happened that the grotesque cruelty of the system would be transformed by moral thought and deed into a class, not caste system, that was fair and nurturing to everybody, right? Um, it wasn't ever clear why, at least to my reading, why, how and why this would happen, right? People would just become more moral. So uh, towards the end of his life, Gandhi changed his mind on some of his earlier uh, stances, such as the prohibitions on intercaste dining and marriage. But his faith in Varna as a stabilizing organizational, organizational system remained intact, right? And we're talking, when I say late, I'm talking about 1945 and 1946, right before he was assassinated. So the person, the man who stood against him in these matters, who debated and fought him and also was a revolutionary, in the, the effort to annihilate caste, right? He wrote a book of the, called The Annihilation of Caste, um, was Dr. Uh, uh, Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar. Right? Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ambedkar was born into, a Mahar, into the Mahar caste, uh, that is to say into a Dalit family who were treated as untouchable. So he came right from the bottom of the system. Despite the innumerable obstacles put in his path, this truly astonishing man achieved the highest educational honors and became the chairman of the constituing, Constituent Drafting Committee for the Indian Constitution and also the first Minister of Law and Justice for India's first independent government. He was the chief architect 
about the of the Indian Constitution after independence. Um, and as these slides uh, just showed you, he was forced to sit in a corner of the classroom when he was a kid, apart from the other students, because he was an untouchable, a supposed untouchable. He was forbidden to touch the cup the other students drank out of. And yet he earned a PhD in econ economics from Columbia University, another one from the London School of Economics and was called to the bar at Gray's Inn in London. He actually applied for another PhD in Bonn, but um, he ran out of money, but, uh, or, or uh, <clears throat> uh, he was too preoccupied with stuff that was happening at home and gave that up. Uh, he wasn't allowed to learn Sanskrit, which is the sacred language uh, for the upper three class. He taught it to himself later in life. He also uh, was a scholar of Pali, uh, the language attached to Buddhism. Um, really, really incredible guy. So he had no illusions about life in villages, right? He thought there were, a, you know, dens of ignorance, narrow-mindedness, and communalism. And he saw Gandhi's romanticization of the village as a force infinite, right? Because it reaches back to a supposed utopia and it's kind of pathetic, right? You're doing this in the face of defeat by the West. And so you're trying to reconstruct your past in order to justify to yourself uh, what happened. So um, um, Ambedkar believed firmly that industrialization and urbanization would liberate Dalits and others from caste oppression and feudalism. Further, modern systems of production demanded scientific and technical education. So he recommended the speedy construction of the infrastructure necessary for mass literacy and education. Social and political reform would, could only move ahead with economic progress. And as labor uh, minister, he instituted reforms to establish provisions for overtime, limited working hours for workers, provident funds, and so on. He was a champion for women's rights and the rights of sex workers. Um, the constitution that he constructed places particular emphasis on caste, religious, and religious, uh, and religious, and gender equality. And as it happens, he wrote out the first copy, the first draft of the Indian constitution with a fountain pen, right? And this is somebody who uh, was close to him, who uh, spent time with him. And it turns out that he was really a pen geek, right? He really liked pens um, and, and used to collect them. Um, he liked uh, fat ones, oversized ones, right? Sheffer, Parker, and Waterman pens. So one might conclude that the superior writing experience provided by these pens was essential to him as a scholar and a writer. It's quite apropos given his own education and his desire to extend knowledge widely and democratically that he is uh, almost always seen in portraits um, and, and paintings uh, with a pen or a book, right? So here he is. Um, there are thousands of statues of Ambedkar in Indian towns and villages, and he always carries a book. That book is always the Indian constitution, not one of the many that he wrote. So um, somewhere um, down the years, um, the pen that Dr. Ambedkar wrote the first draft of the constitution with has been lost. It was probably a thick nib Wilson vacuumatic like this one, right? And this one was actually produced uh, by an Indian manufacturer. Uh, the w Wilson was an Indian company. So uh, this constitution pen has become something of a lost icon. Right, and you see articles like this, which um, I think kind of dramatically and longingly want to find us that pen. And one editor um, um, actually commissioned a journalist to go looking for this pen. It wasn't uh, found, but, but as she says, uh, sifting through history, this, she doesn't find it, but the story of my search became more interesting than the pen's whereabouts, right? Because she, she she learns about a narrative about the pens. Uh, <clears throat> so after independence, the transition of the Indian economy proceeded along Soviet lines right, with heavy centralization and five-year plans. So um, production of goods was strictly controlled from the center uh, in accordance with the planning from the center and extremely heavy uh, uh, taxes were imposed on foreign goods 
Um, some foreign goods you couldn't import at all. And so we live behind the Khadi curtain, right? Um, like the Soviet Iron Curtain. And the rest of the world, especially the West, was very, very far away, right? Um, and, and alluring. So writing tools were now being made in, in India in uh, amounts large enough to satisfy the demand, at least from the middle class. Um, some, like Wilson pens, dated to pre-independence days. Suleika was a Swadeshi ink made in response to a special request from Gandhi himself, right? And this was after he had accepted that fountain pens were going to have to be adopted, but you know he wanted to use Indian products. Um, the advertising that Suleika uh, did always emphasized its Swadeshi beginning and invoked um, Indian mythology, right? So, so. Uh, the story of the Mahabharata, the frame story, insists that um, this great sage and storyteller Vyasa wanted to write um, the story of the Mahabharata, but he recruits Ganesh to write this very, very long story. And Ganesh says, okay, I'm going to do it. Uh, Ganesh, the, the god that you all know. And he says, I'm going to do it, but you have to never let me stop writing. Right? I have to write continuously. Um, and Vyasa says, okay, to the deal, but he says, uh, listen, if I say something that you don't understand, a particularly complex verse, you have to sit and think it up, right? There's this exchange. But what it says um, at the bottom, I think you can see it, that the, the excellent, uh, the distinctive excellence of Suleika lies uh, in its unrestrained flow, uh, which has made it so highly popular, right? So it's efficient ink. Uh, other local brands, uh, though, uh, appeal to groovy bell-bottom um, 60s and 70s wearing, bell-bottom wearing um, scholars from the 60s and 70s. Um, there was innovation, right? So the fountain pen and the ballpoint pen are all now left behind by the Luxor 3D auto pen. Um, I love the auto in there. Um, and it's got a miracle point which does everything. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, but what happens is that, that the allure of the West is inescapable, right? So here's a Parker pen and Parker is an American company. So this ad directed at Indians tells you, you know, it gives you um, the glamor of, of travel to faraway places. Um, and it appeals to not just globetrotters, but anyone who aspires to be one. So when I was in school, um, uh, um, anybody who actually wrote with a Parker pen ascended, you know, to the height, heights of writing coolness. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and even on the lower end of the scale, putting in a pale, pale blonde foreigner was never a bad idea. Um, when I was 17, I suddenly came in, uh, into possession of some amazing American technology. I don't remember the exact make or model. I wish I'd kept it, but it looked very much like this. Um, my father had to go to America on a business trip, which was paid for by his company. And so my mother broke out her savings to go along. And she came back, of course, with a couple of pair of Levi's and um, cool American shades that I desperately wanted. But she knew me well, so she put one of these, she put this thing inside her suitcase and brought it back for me. And that was a complete surprise. I didn't know how to type, but as I hunted and pecked, I knew I was going through some sort of profound transformative experience. I'd seen typewriters in use, of course, in government offices and at my college, but hitting the keys and watching the letters form my own words in print-like form was tremendously exciting and even moving. When I think back to those moments, I'm reminded of always of Brett Victor's remark. Um, and he's speaking to programmers here, right? Because programmers are the other class of people who write copiously all the time. Um, creators need an immediate connection to what they're creating. And for me, the typewriter gave me that connection, right? It was closer to actual book form. And so, especially as a kid, I was, I'd been publishing in school magazines and college magazines, student run magazines. But the idea of imagining myself actually in print was, was completely exhilarating and, and to somebody, you're not sure at that age whether you're actually going to ever do it or not. So, um, and, and the reason he's talking about this in reference to programming also is that um, 
there's a gap in programming, right? So when you write code and you want to see its effect, you first have to compile it. And the compilation can sometimes take a long time. And so finally, when you see it, uh, you know, a tree on a screen, this, you lose that immediate connection, right? And then you kind of have to remember what's wrong with what you saw, come back and change code, right? So, so there's some languages, environments in which you can do live code changes, right? As soon as you change, you see the thing. But for the most part, you can't do that. Um, writers also need an immediate connection to what they're creating. Uh, this is what has driven innovation uh, from the Caliph al muiz onwards. Remember he said, uh, whenever a person wishes to write with it, he fills it with ink and thereby write whatever he likes in that moment, right? And then when you're carrying it about, uh, after filling the ink, whenever you want to sit down and write, you can do it. Uh, I also think of Dr. Ambedkar testing pens, scrawling his broad autograph, as it says, and it seems to me he was looking for the most fluid, transparent experience of getting his words onto paper. Even Gandhi, despite his distrust of machinery, finally had to give in to the seductions of the fountain pen and ask for Swadeshi ink. I had read plenty about computers and science fiction, but I'd never actually seen one until I came to the United States as an undergrad. At the time, the only computers in India were mainframes and minis ensconced in elite engineering institutions like the IITs and in banks and the weather department. So as soon as I had shaken off the jet lag on campus, I enrolled in a programming class and found my way to the time-sharing mainframe on campus. Uh, the programming class turned out to be boring. I could sort word lists, but what was the point? The encounter with the big computer, on the other hand, was really exciting and again transformative. The experience of writing in a fluid environment that allowed easy changes, that let me move ch chunks of text from one page to another swiftly, that was amazing, truly amazing. And the ability to create draft after draft, this rescue from retyping pages or entire stories because I'd misspelled something, how did I ever live without that? Um, the first novel written on a computer was Len Dayton's Bomber, a gripping story about a single nighttime air raid over Germany during World War II. By the time Dayton began writing this book, he was already famous and rich. He had published a bunch of espionage thrillers that had done really well, um, both critically and commercially. He wrote a cooking column for The Observer, kind of polymath. And he was also travel editor for Playboy. In 1968, an IBM technician visited Dayton's house to service his typewriters. And the salesman uh, uh, technician learned that Dayton's secretary, Eleanor Hanley, had been retyping his drafts up to two dozen times. And then the technician uh, told Dayton that IBM had a new machine called the MT72, or the Magnetic Tape Selectric Typewriter. He invited Dayton to see one in operation, and thereupon, after seeing how, how efficient it was, Dayton agreed to use one to write Bomber. The magnetic tape selectric typewriter was actually a 200-pound behemoth that was crane lifted into the house after a window was removed. After the, the MT-72 was installed, Dayton continued to use one of his old typewriters. Um, Eleanor Hanley was the one who learned how to use the new machine and actually processed Dayton's uh, words uh, into the novel that was published in 1970 to critical acclaim and commercial success. And if you're interested um, in, the, uh, in, you know, on literary grounds or excitement grounds or literary history value grounds, you should read the book. It's really good. Uh, Dayton had always typed his manuscript on papers of different colors one for each point of view. This allowed him to see the proportion of points of view um, across the novel as a whole, or, or sections of the novel as a whole. So his new machine, uh, and this might be of interest to you, right? This analogy that he makes, that he's trained as, a, um, um, as, as a, an illustrator, and he likes this collage method of working, right? Why should he write a novel from beginning to end as, as one long flow? Um, and so this, this uh, fit perfectly on, on into his workflow, and 
he says this, one might always think that the word processor, as it was eventually named, right? This is so new that it hasn't been named yet, this system, was built to my requirements. Not all writers were so enthusiastic, especially in those early days. Many were anxious, as Gandhi was, about the speed of writing on a word processor. It was feared that writers wouldn't think enough about the, we, the words they were putting down on their, uh, if their writing tools allowed them to go too fast, right? So here the anxiety is not about bad handwriting. It's actually about speed and sloppy like work. And I personally have never understood this. I type pretty quickly, but on average it's taken me a little more than seven years to write a book. So one would hope that even super fast typists would go back and revise. Um, other writers value the physical connection with writing tools and paper. Uh, John Barth was my very, uh, my, my teacher and very ge generous uh, mentor at Johns Hopkins. And he writes with a fountain pen, right? And what he likes about it, that something about the actual physical contact gets his imagination, his creativity to work again. Um, Rebecca West wrote with a pencil and she thinks that, that, um, that her memory, right, which is also a part by him going on and on about history and technology, the history of technology to you. Um, uh, memory is certainly important to a writer, right? And she says, I can remember things only if I have a pencil and I can write with it and I can play with it, right? So there's a kind of pleasure of play with a pencil as well. Uh, Iris Murdoch, um, felt a kind of separation with what she was creating, right? So there's a glass window and here are your thoughts, um, there are your thoughts. And because they look like print, they assume a premature error completeness. How can you write with a machine between you and the page? But for me, the glass square is a window within which I float my words, right? I can create them and see them floating in there. Uh, and, and sentences, and I can, um, like Dayton, I really like that I can move them around. I started with backspacing. I do that incessantly. I revise and re revise and revise. Um, uh, for my last book, which was nonfiction, which was, it's a new form to me. If I'm remembering correct, correctly, I had 39 revisions before it went to the publisher. Um, for me, it's paper that is too permanent and alienating. It fixes my language into place as soon as I write it. But this quality of paper is sometimes a welcome alienation. Every time I finish a draft, and, I'm, um, and I just did this with the first third of my, the book I'm working on right now, I print out, print it out and read it. And the sentences look suddenly strange and, and I'm distanced away and uh, distant from them enough to feel missteps and miscalculations, right? Everywhere from the rhythm of sentence, the, the quality of a certain uh, diction, the weight of a word, all the way up to paragraphs and chapters. Uh, I mark all this up in, with a green pen, then return to the computer. I create a new copy of the draft, and then I edit it and add to it. And so it's this constant cycle of moving between paper um, and um, you know, the glass square. Um, although I have to say that I spend a lot more time in the glass square than I spend with paper. So writing is therefore a process uh, alternating closeness and distance, immersion and emergence. From the selfish perspective of the writer, the instruments that are the best are the ones that enable this movement, this constant movement. The computer that I began writing my first novel on was this. <laughs> Some of, I don't know, maybe Greg will remember this. This was the IBM PC Junior. Um, as a graduate student, I didn't have enough money to buy a computer myself. So um, uh, a generous friend, uh, I should name her Wendy James, may she remain blessed forever. She lent me this machine, which was she, no, she was no longer using in her business. Um, it didn't have a hard drive. And um, you can see on the front, it had only floppy, one floppy drive. Right? Do you guys, have you guys, the guys handled a floppy? It's like a disk, this square. It flops about, that's why it's called a floppy. Um, uh, so it only has one floppy disk. So what that means is I had to insert the floppy with the operating system. I had to switch on uh, this computer. It would boot up. I would take out that uh, DOS floppy, then insert the one on the disk with my word processor, which was WordStar, ancient prehistory. 
um, I would start WordStar and then take that floppy out and then insert the floppy on which I had saved my manuscript. If I wanted to really risk stuff, I would have WordStar and the, the, my manuscript on the same floppy, but I always felt like that was a bad idea. Um, um, if I asked WordStar to do something and it hadn't stored that function in memory, I had to take out the data floppy, insert the WordStar floppy, and then remove it and put the manuscript floppy in again. Right, and there was a lot of juggling. Um, however, it still worked for me. Right, um, on the first day of graduate school at Johns Hopkins, I started working with that, and it was so great to be able to write in my room in graduate student housing, um, instead of in the basement of the library on a mainframe. Um, and again, there's a kind of closeness here. Right, you're moving from a big, huge machine that you're time sharing with other people, and suddenly you have this thing that you can you can have in your own room and work with. I wrote steadily and was satisfied with my progress. And yet the so-called chiclet keyboard on this IBM PC Junior has been described as the worst keyboard in the history of computing. It was innovative in that it was wireless, but it ate up batteries at an alarming pace, a rate. You had to position the keyboard just so in range of the computer at a specific angle or it wouldn't work. So even putting it on your, on your lap below the desk would cut off the communication. The keys were hard plastic and nothing was printed on them. And so they looked like chiclets. The, the letters and uh, this was, did I say this? This was infamous as the chiclet keyboard. Um, the letters and numbers and symbols were printed above the keys in a very tiny font. Typing on this thing was hard and annoying and infuriating. The PC Junior was IBM's big effort to carry the uh, to capture the home market, but this keyboard killed that hope stone dead, and as well as should have. Right, this was a disgusting piece of equipment. Right, <laughs> not at all like a well-designed fountain pen. Um, after a year of writing with this abomination, I got a, a grant, uh, like you know, from the university, um, and I should have spent it on food or whatever, but I used it all to buy a computer and equip it with a keyboard that actually worked. And once I was making some money as a programmer, I got one of these. This company, Northgate, made PCs as well, but they made most of their money from their keyboards, which were famous for the amount of thought that had gone into their design and the quality of their construction. Um, this is the keyboard that I use now. Um, it's a gaming keyboard, um, and it's a good keyboard because gamers um, need responsive keys that provide tactile feedback. So these are mechanical keys. Uh, they optimize, gamers optimize for risk comfort, you know, therefore the split keyboard. And, uh, you know, that also like eases strain on your shoulders. And I'm talking to you about keyboards at some length because I'm baffled by the amount of writers I meet who don't think about keyboards until they're beset by carpal tunnel syndrome. Your keyboard is the your first point of contact with the software tool that you create with. I mean, I don't understand how anyone can stand to write with these horrible MacBook keyboards, right? I should confess that I'm an old school Apple hater, so I'm probably being prejudiced here. Um, and, and, you know, if you write on a bad keyboard, you might as well be working with a leaky grading fountain pen. So a connection, an immediate connection with what you're writing is what you need. But what about the software on the other end of the keyboard? Traditional word processes have always frustrated me because they create streams of dumb text, which is to say that when I'm writing one, I'm using one of these programs, like the bloated Microsoft Word, um, there's no connection between the manuscript and the universe that I'm creating, the fictional or real universe that I'm creating. Remember, my last book was nonfiction. So my thoughts about the characters and the research notes I've gathered over many years are scattered across my computer and word files and note keeping apps. The scholarly articles I've been gathering in, as PDFs or in folders or a reference keeping program. The web page links I've been gathering are in a note keeping program. I, I just checked this morning uh, in that note keeping program. I have 18,910 notes in that app. When I write in Word, uh, I've been using it for years, I should say. When I write in Word, if I need to check a reference, it sometimes takes me half an hour to find the damn thing. Sometimes I can't find it at all. So I co-founded a startup with my tech genius co-founder, uh, Boris Erdanov, 
to create a writing environment called Granthika. Imagine a word processor integrated with a database and a timeline. So as you can see from the menu, um, the horizontal menu along the top, um, Granthika manages all the elements of a fictional or real universe, um, characters, location, events, objects. In the editor, um, those yellow uh, highlights means that you've attached some knowledge to those, um, to those pieces of text. Uh, and if you do you know, one command click or control click, you jump over to uh, the the, uh, the the page where you've stored all your notes, you know, birthdays, aliases, and so forth, uh, and your notes. And with one more click, you're back in your editor. So again, something that doesn't interfere with my connection with what I'm creating. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, this, by the way, um, handling timelines is really difficult, right? This is a timeline for the book that I'm working on currently. Uh, which is set in 1999. So I'm kind of trying to keep track of real events that happened during 99, and as well as my fictional events, right? And the trouble with fictional events is that if you move one event a week ahead, all the downstream and upstream events have to move along as well. Um, and again, with one click, you can move from this uh, visualization of events to the editor and back and forth. Uh, so uh, Greg um, told you that, that one of my books, um, Sacred Games, was made into a Netflix series. Um, the person standing up there is uh, the showrunner and one of the directors, Vikramaditya Motwane. And these guys are hanging out in Goa uh, because they got so frustrated with working in Bombay. They needed a retreat. And here they're trying to make sense of the episodic structure. Right? So each of the vertical columns is an episode. Uh, the cards themselves uh, represent um, uh, scenes, right? And you can't see this, but this the um, the scenes are are marked with like sort of thematic color uh, coding, right? So you can keep track of how everything moves, and it's really useful. Uh, Vikram told me actually that they were really glad, uh, and that's around him other writers in the core team. Uh, but they used it excitedly for one day, but then the cards started falling off the wall, right? And then it was too it took too long to recreate it, right? So um, inspired in part by this photograph and then by the need, this is what in Granthika we call the board view, right? And it's essentially doing the same thing, except this time it's on a novel, chapters and scenes, right? You can imagine parts and sections and scenes. I'll grant you that creating a new writing tool because of my writerly frustrations is a big extreme, but I can tell you that my writing mornings are happier as a result. Uh, I'm running late, so I'm going to skip over a bit. Uh, we one of the things that we want to do next in Granthika uh, is attach text generation, right? And what I mean by text generation is using these incredibly powerful algorithms, um, which are neural networks that generate text on the basis of a prompt you give to them, right? You put some text in, and the algorithm gives you back uh, text. Right? So here I'm going to show you one. So this, this is a really famous poem, Sanskrit poem. It's so strange and, and so weird. Um, I didn't want to take up time to show you another one, but I think it gets even better. Um, uh, I have lost the thread of time, right? <laughs> and, uh, He's so, anyway, so, so I don't want to take up any more time with this, right? <clears throat> so um, some writers think these algorithms are frightening that they will replace us, right? That they will replace writers. But I remember the Qadi Abu Hanifa al-Numan who recorded the making of the Caliph's pen. He wrote, there became apparent to me in, 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 in there became apparent to me in it, which is to say the pen, a fine moral example in that the pen does not release its contents except when specifically requested to do so and for some useful purpose, which is part of the original reason for asking it to write. It lavishes benefits on whoever, um, um, on whoever seeks them, but withholds them from the person who does not thus seek. So we shall also be changed by the tools we write with. Inevitably, first we make the tools, then the tools make us. Thank you.
Wow, what a, what a journey. Uh, you took us uh, to the very beginnings of uh, the Indian uh, um, Revolution, and uh, you illustrated all these points about the politics of writing tools. And so I have a question on my mind. Does anybody else have a question that's burning right now? Anybody want to start? Is there any questions online? Okay, so I'm going to start and I'm going to ask you this question. So you, you elaborated thoughtfully on the, the politics of uh, indigenous uh, fabrication um, uh, of tools and the meaning of having a pen or even a quill made uh, locally. And uh, so when you write software for your own writing, of course, you're making your own tools. But at the same time, when we look at some algorithms like the GPT-6, um, those are often tools that are made by corporate entities. Mm. So what do you think are the uh, politics inherent in working constantly in dialogue with a large corporation? To me, that is a burning question because I'm like, well, it's so convenient and so easy, but this autocomplete also pushes me into directions right. that I wouldn't normally put, go into, but also I'm part of a system that I'm not fully aware that I'm part of it. Right. So this project is actually um, uh, an open source project, the one that I showed you. Right, so it's an open source, um, so you can see the code <coughs> and work on it, whoever you are. Um, but I agree with you that the more most powerful, or at least the most um, widespread technologies are being made by by big corporations with <coughs> horrible, you know, their practices are not just amoral, they're, they're evil, right? So I think what we need is, is two related things. One is that um, we need to have a revolution against the, the, the machine, right? That, that big machine. And it's really hard to do, but we need it, right? The other thing I should say to do is don't romanticize the past, right? Uh, <clears throat> indigenous cultures of all sorts are also filled with caste oppression, with, with um, horrors inflicted on women, right? And the poor, so so I would much rather prefer Ambedkar's Dr. Ambedkar's way than in in this context than Gandhi's way, right? Um, and also, I should say that um, Ambedkar was had no illusions about industrialization either, right? He saw what was wrong with it, but he was ready to deal with it, um, and especially in the Constitution and then other laws that have passed. Um, ever since, uh, a way to deal with that issue, right? With all the power of the corporation behind it, right? Um, <clears throat> the psychotic, like sort of sociopathic behavior of corporations. Um, and, and so it's, it's a dual thing, it's not just simple. Right? Um, and and uh, I mean, you know, like Amazon in India, there was a big story broken on Reuters yesterday that they're actually trying to kill smaller Indian retailers, because what they do is they watch which products are selling best and they duplicate them down to the finest detail, right? So there's a shirt manufacturer and they're copying the measurement of the collars and the sleeves, the proportions, and then they rebrand it um, in their own way. And then they start Amazon produced thing and they start selling it. They've done it here also, right? William Sonoma, right? They exactly duplicated um, furniture. Right, and William Sonoma had the resources to file a federal lawsuit. There was a settlement, a private settlement, so we don't know exactly what happened. But a small retailer or a business or an individual has no hope of actually doing that, right? Against a globally powerful corporation. I mean, we've all learned recently about the evils of Facebook, right? <clears throat> so I'm, I have no illusions, and I don't think Dr. Ambedkar would have also, but. Um, um, we need to think about the other end as well, right? Both about the past and the present. Uh, I was talking about the middle class in India. Um, uh, millions of people ever since liberalization in the 90s have been lifted out of poverty, right? Uh, again, that's sad as a bad part. The current government is essentially selling uh, the entire country to billionaires, right? And so what's happening is that under the, the, the label of efficiency, right? Every airport, a lot of airports in India have been given to um, this guy called Adani, right? And, and they look really slick and they are 
you know, more efficient airport. But but this closeness to the government creates this um, corrupt system, right? As here, right? Lobbying is another word for corruption. Right? Uh, so anyway, I'm going on too long about this, but but I think it's a it's a it's a subtle, complex thing, and we shouldn't simplify it. I do note that open source and building your own tools with open source is a very public and transparent way of going about thinking about balancing these things out. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I see one up there. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. We really enjoyed it. I was wondering, um, how do you feel like your creative process differs or compares when you use like a paper and a writing tool versus a software program? No, I, if this is what you mean, I pretty much never write on paper, right? I mean, I have a notebook in my backpack, but I use it pretty much to take notes if I'm speaking to somebody um, and I need to like really, I don't have my laptop and I really need to write fast. So it's a scrawl, but you know, my handwriting is bad. Uh, so I sometimes have trouble deciphering afterward. So I'm not such a good person to talk about the difference, except that to say that for me, now the computer has become my home space for creation, right? I've, I've managed to work out a system on it and then with Granthika attempted to do an improvement on that system that I hope that other people would find amenable and it fits into their need, right? And I should say also, this is so individual that, um, I mean, one of my kind of lessons when I do like how to write classes is use the tools that work for you, right? Um, I mean, uh, what's funny is that, that uh, whenever I've gone on a book tour and after I finish reading and I do Q&A, somebody will always ask, you know, things like, when do you write? Um, what do you write with? You know, what's on your desk? Um, and I understand that curiosity, but, but I try to say, like, there's no secret key to the kingdom, right? Um, I, whatever I tell you is going to be things that are useful to me, they might not be useful for you. Um, and I remember as a kid and as a young person, I always used to read these how to write books and they would have these kind of prescriptions and I would always feel bad because I wasn't doing half of those things, right? Um, and so I think any kind of prescriptions about the creative process are, are not just like sort of confusing, they're actually pernicious if one obeys them too literally, right? And again, I, I should say that, that, that uh, this kind of how to write um, debates have been taking place um, for thousands of years, right? I know them best in the Indian context and there are books in the eighth and 10th centuries where, where this really funny guy, I like him a lot. Uh, he says that after the poet um, finishes the process of creation in the morning, the entire household should not talk to him for a while. <laughs> And I love that because I'm grumpy and introverted. And like when I finish, I, I'm tired, right? I don't write that much every day, like 400 words, but I do not want to be having human interaction, right? For a while until I take my, I, I eat lunch and then have my afternoon siesta, right? And drink my chai, right? Then I'm a more like amenable human being. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's my spiel about you know, efficiency and communication and an immediate connection, creatively immediate connection with the thing that you're creating. Thank you, good answer. Does that work for you? What's striking to me about the answer is that you kind of have to figure it out on your own and you have to keep figuring it out for the rest of your life. Like, it's striking to me that you're still working on optimizing your writing system, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a good answer, uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of disillusioning answer. It never gets better or easier, right? I mean, the grind of it remains the same. I don't care if you won the Nobel Prize, your next book is going to be as hard as your first one. Um, I did a um, bunch of online webinars about writing with a friend of mine, Hussain Zazi, who's a great crime writer and fiction writer in, in India. And when we were planning the talk, you know, I told him that I was going to talk about the bad parts as well, 
And he was like, you know, don't do that. We're trying to get people to become writers. We need more writers. I'm like, no, I mean, you don't want to like tell lies, right? You have to be prepared for the grind. Um, and by the way, since I'm talking to you, the poverty. 99.9999% uh, of the people in the world, of the writers in the world, do not make a living from writing. I don't care like whether you write thrillers or not. Uh, so most writers have day jobs, right? Um, that's especially true when you're young. Um, you know the sort of stereotypical story of uh, waiting on tables in Hollywood looking for your first break? That's actually true, right? So, I don't know, since I'm in an advice giving mode right now in this moment, I mean, start thinking about that. What your mother tells you about if you're gonna be an artist, how are you gonna live? It's actually a real question. My mother's a writer, by the way. Um, she used to write for a uh, place for radio way back and then we moved to Bombay and she started writing screenplays and she's had some very successful films. But when I and my sisters started to talk about being creative in one way or the other, because she had seen the checks and I'd seen the checks used to get for writing a one and a half hour play. It's like, okay, you, you know, how are you gonna survive, right? And because she knew the reality, right? Okay, I'll stop. I had one, yeah. I was wondering about your opinion on um, iPads and like handwriting on the iPad. Cause I was debating for like two years. I like writing by hand a lot and writing on paper is really important for me, but again, what you said about the computer really spoke to me how you can copy and make space and you don't you're not as bound by paper so i was wondering i've just been trying it out and um, i was wondering your thoughts yeah i mean uh, i mean i have a phone in my pocket that i write on um in lieu of a notebook right um and and what's also nice is that <clears throat> once i do that because it's all connected by the cloud i can actually see those notes on my computer and my big monitors when I work. Um, so there's a kind of transference that makes managing information easier. What I find with this still um, is that, and I'm sure you've, if you've tested it, you know, the, the, the pen, the stylus slides across the glass in a way that is not quite like paper, right? And I've, I've tried using Wacom tablets, although they're too big to actually carry around in my pocket. Um, and I think those are better to some degree, but it's still not a paper-like experience. So I think when somebody solves that problem, that would become be really, really cool. Um, and, and much more efficient. Um, I mean, and, and I like it. I mean, sometimes if I'm listening to a lecture like this, um, I, I can make notes pretty quickly. I can do little drawings and copy things from, from the slides. Um, and then also the ability to change colors, right? On the pen name, that, that is really fun. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think you should try it and see if it works the same way with you, right? And you might be one of those people, and I think maybe you are if you're like writing, like Iris Mordock, you need the connection with the medium, right? Pencil to paper to actually feel like your memory coming alive, your creativity coming alive. Uh, or, you know, mm -hmm. lovely Jack Barth, right? Um, John Barth. Um, <clears throat> in that his contact with the paper actually brings his imagination back and makes it work better. Thank you. Um, any any other questions online in the chat? We're good. Anne Walsh um, says, thank you, Vikram. I'm currently reading your book about code and so grateful for this talk. I love how you constructed it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, that book is actually the nonfiction book that I was writing about. And um, what was also really urgent about it was that I needed to keep tracks of huge amounts of information because I wanted to footnote everything and not get myself in trouble. The lovely thing about fiction is that you can tell lies, right? Um, although you do get, when I, whenever I've released a book, there'll be somebody in the world who'll know more about like train departure schedules in India in Bombay than I do, and they'll find it. And mostly it's not like in, in a bad hectoring tone, they'll just point it out to me, right? And then if I can, I try and get the publishers to make that correction. Um, but in a, in a nonfiction context, um, people do get angry, right? Um, and so again, I had this huge problem of, um, 
of managing all that. Um, and it was really difficult. Um, it was actually after that book released and I was on book tour, I spent a lot of time in hotel rooms and on flights and in lounges. Um, and that's when I started writing the software proposal that actually became Grand Theater, right? So that book happened before. Um, if I was writing it today, I would write it in this software rather than that stuff. Uh, and also, since we're talking about literature, and I'm, <laughs> this is a huge self plug, but that book is about code and logic. Um, and then um, it's also about, um, <clears throat> uh, about what constitutes beauty in poetic language, right? How beauty is produced, how pleasure aesthetic pleasure is produced through poetry and other kinds of poetic language. Um, and that's the thing that I want to explore. The subtitle of the book is The Code of Beauty and uh, the Beauty of Code. Um, so. Thank you. Maybe with that, we should wrap up because uh, it's been good and it's been very thought provoking and, and um, also very contemplative. Thank you for guiding us uh, so generously through your experiences with writing. And please, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, let's do another talk with you soon, where we follow up on more literary questions. That would be great. Okay, thank you so much. Um.